All right, uh, welcome. My name is Luis Martinez. I'm the Vice President with the ICDR. I want to thank all of you for attending this International Construction Arbitration Webinar, the first in a four-part series that covers various phases of an international construction project uh, and its contractual provisions. This series is being hosted by the ICDR, the International Division of the American Arbitration Association. It's Young and International Group, and it is being recorded. It uh, shall be available on the ICDR YNI site located at icdr.org under educational resources. There you'll find our recorded program library, further information on future programs, including this series, and if you'd like to join the YNI group to receive information on all YNI programs and initiatives, the registration form is there as well. Now, international construction arbitration is an extremely important caseload for the ICDR. And each year, it is one of the business sectors that most often use the ICDR's international administrative services. Working with our domestic colleagues, in the AAA's construction division, we continue to promote and develop our services responding to the needs of the construction industry. Our construction mega panel and international construction roster of arbitrators reflect our commitment to recognizing that global expertise matters, especially with the complexities involved in the construction industry. Uh, the ICDR also recently revised its international arbitration and mediation rules, which took effect on March 1st of this year. They include process efficiencies along with best practices for saving time and costs while participating in the ICDR system. They are frequently used in international construction disputes. And if you'd like to have further information on these rules and their revisions, there's an article you can find again on icdr.org. So now I would like to introduce our moderator for this program, Zach Torres Fowler. Zachary is a senior associate with the law firm of Troutman Pepper Hamilton Sanders and is based in Philadelphia and New York. Zach is a member of the firm's construction group where he specializes in complex US domestic and international construction arbitration matters. And he's also a member of the ICDR YNI's Global Advisory Board. So Zach, welcome, and let me turn the program over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Liz. Can, can everyone hear me all right? Um, well, welcome everyone. We've had a great turnout. I, I appreciate everyone kind of uh, joining us for today. Um, like, like Louis said, I'm, uh, my name is Zach Torres Fowler. I'm a member of the ICDR YNI's Global Advisory Board. And, I'm hosting today's or moderating today's um, webinar on sort of front end construction project issues. Uh, and, and the concept behind this webinar is that it's part of a series of webinars that the ICDR YNI is going to be hosting um, that's really dedicated to introducing sort of core concepts that young arbitration practitioners should understand when they're first sort of thrown into their, their first big arbitration case. And I can tell you, speaking from my own personal experience, uh, this sort of webinar would have been very useful for me when I was a, a first year or second year. Um, and so to help us get there, uh, I have, I'm joined by four experts in the field. Uh, I'm going to introduce them, uh, beginning with Wendy Vinoit, who is a partner uh, with the construction group of Hinkley Allen in Boston, um, where her practice focuses on litigation and arbitration of complex U.S. domestic projects or U.S. domestic arbitrations and international construction projects. Um, Wendy is both an advocate and an arbitrator. Uh, she sits on um, the ICDR's panels of, of, of arbitrators and the AAA's mega construction projects panel. So thank you, Wendy. Uh, next is Aisha Nadar, who is a special consultant with the firm of Advocat and Furman Ruinland. Uh, I, I know I butchered that, I, I apologize. Uh, but Aisha is based in Sweden and in Stockholm. Uh, Aisha manages large-scale construction projects. Uh, she assists parties and advises parties uh, all over the world and handles negotiations and the implementation of, of construction projects. Uh, Aisha is also uh, uh, an arbitrator, mediator, adjudicator, and regular dispute board member. Uh, next is, is Richard Wong. Uh, Richard is a partner with 
the law firm of Osler, Hoskin, Harcourt, based in Toronto, Canada, where he is a chair of the firm's construction and infrastructure practice group. Um, Rich Richard focuses on front-end construction uh, project issues and advises clients on a con in connection with a wide range of civil infrastructure, energy, and natural resource projects. And last is uh, Nicholas Gould, who joins us from, from London. I, I'm assuming you're in London now, Rich. I see you're, you're at home, it's, it looks like. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm in the, in the UK, not just outside London. Nice okay. to see you all. Um, Richard is, I'm sorry, Nicholas is uh, a partner with Finnick Elliott. He, he focuses on international construction disputes uh, and project works um, and regularly advises clients in connection with a wide variety of, of form contracts and bespoke agreements. Um, so with that, and, and, and not to short shrift the panelists, they all have a wonderful and wide variety of expertise in this field. I just want to thank all of you for being here. Um, and, and before we jump in, um, like I said, this is going to focus on sort of core front end project delivery issues that you know, young practitioners need to understand. Um, the one thing that I do want to emphasize and highlight for everyone is just the idea of um, project or risk allocation and the importance that has on terms of how you develop and structure project delivery from the outset. And, and I say this not to be trite because I know risk allocation is just a part of the contract uh, that everyone agrees to. It's just part of contract in general. Uh, but it kind of plays a special role in our world where risk allocation at the outset really does, and an understanding risk allocation at the outset affects how you approach and understand disputes later on when it comes to arbitration. So when we talk about project delivery and we talk about contracts, the one thing I want you all to keep in mind is just what sort of risk allocation are the parties trying to accomplish when they enter into these agreements to deliver a big uh, project. So, so with that said, um, I want to turn to Nicholas to kind of kick things off. Um, Nicholas, when, when someone talks about project delivery or project delivery method, what, what are we referring to? Like what, what is conceptually, what is, what is the, what is that supposed to reflect? Yeah. Okay. So just, just briefly on this point, I think um, one of the problems with the term project delivery is it means different things to different people. If you are uh, an owner employer. So, I mean, they're the driving force really behind all projects. They're the ones that, that want the project done. Then for them, it's, it's the whole project. The whole thing needs to be delivered. Um, whereas it's a bit different when you turn to the contractor and, and, and once you're on the supply side and you're looking at the contractor, project delivery is something a bit smaller for them. It's dealing with that particular project from when they get the site to, to handing it back over. And then I think you have to look at the, the professionals, the consultants as, as well that are being engaged by the by the owner employer and, and, and think about it from their perspective because you know for them they're a part of the jigsaw too they're not physically they're building it but they 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 get the ball rolling they put the documents in place they probably put the contract in place the specification and they think about maybe just the project or the life cycle costing of the whole job and of course uh, the, the the move towards zero carbon is another thing as well that's going to get people to start to think about project delivery as being not just here and now and the physical thing but but the future use and life of it as well and so what what, you know, take it from more of the sort of traditional owner contractor relationship, right? Yep, you've got yep. an owner who wants to, you know, build uh, an airport uh, and you have a contractor who says, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll be willing to, to, I'll execute that work for you. What are sort of the considerations when it comes to project delivery? And what are some of the factors that go into how an owner kind of controls that process and what, what factors do we think, what, what controls does the contractor have over? process and sort of instituting or implementing a project delivery method. Um, in you know, something like an airport, well, when you turn to a, quite a complex, large project, um, you know, it depends really on, on quite how they go about delivering it. And an airport is a good example because you, you might decide you're not going to have one contractor. You, you might decide, you talked about risk earlier, risk allocation, I want all of the risk for delivery to be with the contractor for the next five years. Uh, that might not be the best thing to do. If you're an experienced owner uh, operator, you might decide to break it into packages so that you can um, get certain parts done with more control over the project delivery and see bigger problems then coming. Um, you know, if you've got a problem with one package, you can manage that whilst other things are possibly going well. 
you can also spend time looking at the baggage handling system, which is you know one of the huge fundamental and costly parts of those projects, and plan that ahead, uh, uh, ready for when it, it starts to come into the, the physical the physical building. Whereas if you hand everything over to one contractor, it's great from a risk perspective, but you totally lose control. You're going to get it handed back when they're ready to hand it back, and if they have a terrible time dealing with it, that doesn't actually help you. So, um, you know, pushing all risk uh, on projects isn't necessarily the best way. And when you look at complex projects like like that, you might break it up into packages. Um, that's certainly one way of doing it. I, I've I've worked on projects that have gone both ways, and certainly some where they've had joint venture contractors. Some have gone well, and others have been. I don't know if I should mention Berlin Airport here, spectacularly badly, um, uh, three, four years late and, 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 a, and a huge amount over, overrun. And, but these things happen. And that's the strange thing about construction delivery. I, you, you know, you, on these large projects, all sorts of things do happen. I've worked on large projects where they've gone well, but they are in the minority. Well, good. Well, well moving from sort of high level, I want to talk a little bit about sort of the, the alphabet soup of construction agreements. Um, you know, we hear, and I know Aisha and Wendy have given presentations on this. There are probably, there are more than a dozen different forms, probably more than that. Uh, uh, when it comes to kind of the specific types of contracts that construction parties use, owners, contractors, suppliers, subcontractors, you know, let me turn to Aisha. What are some of the more traditional models that parties use to deliver uh, projects, um, you know, like the EBC agreements of the world. And what, what do those do? What do they mean? Yeah, I think um, following on from what Nick has said, you can either break it, you know, have an entire project or break it down into packages. So, and, and we can just look at one contract. And we're, what I like to start is the, the, the starting point is who's going to be responsible for designing the project. And that's a, a starting point. So the tradition, what we always call the traditional type of project delivery or design, you design first and then you tender and then you build. So it's design, bid and build. It's exactly what, what it says. <laughs> so the employer designs or has someone design on his behalf and then undertakes, uh, and, and this is where we, we, we cross the world in language, the, the divide of the English language. You can say procurement, tendering, uh, acquisition, but you, that whole process of selecting someone to build or execute your design. Uh, so you, the, so it, that is the first type where the, employer says, I am going to design this and I'm going to separately tender, procure, decide on who's going to construct it for me. So I separate construction from design. And that why that's called traditional is because both in the UK and in the US, this is not true in every other jurisdiction, but those two functions where the architect or the consulting engineer did undertook the design on the, the employer's behalf was a separate type of function and must was legally separated from the construction works and it was required to be separated from the construction works. So now we move forward to the mid 90s where they employers started finding that, yeah, we could have the same entity design and construct for me and that single point of responsibility. So I'm no longer uh, separating design from construction contractually. And then we enter into this design build type of world. So, so when you say alphabet soup, the first traditional is uh, design hyphen bid hyphen build. So D, B, uh, B. And then you enter into lesser number of letters, 
the design build type of world where you combine the design function and the, con the building or construction function into one type of contract. And both you and Nicholas mentioned risks, as we know, and we'll, we'll enter a, a, a more elaborate conversation on the allocation of risk. But once you've decided who's going to, how you're, which project delivery method you're going to follow, you, with the pivot being the design, who's going to carry the risk of, or the carry the design risk, then there's a multitude of other types of risks that every project will be exposed to. And this is what starts differentiating the types of design build type of contracts. So you might have a design build contract that where the employer still maintains a lot of their own or retains a lot of their own risks and don't shift them. But if we can get into EPC, we've heard that uh, engineer procure construct. So you're, you're undertaking the design responsibility. And as Nicholas had mentioned, the employer shedding more risk to the contractor, but obviously paying a higher price, those risks can be unforeseen site conditions and the like. But the, the, the basic distinction I would say is your first starting point in deciding a project delivery method is who's going to design, who's gonna carry the risk of design, the employer or someone else on his behalf, and that's going to be contractually separated from the construction, or are you gonna lump them together in a design build and then um, focus on other types of construction um, risks also to be shed or to be shifted to the contractor. And just to, as a last point, Nicholas's airport example to, to, to build on that, you can, if you're gonna talk about the, the baggage handling system that can be a, a delivery of equipment, the baggage handling, but who's going to install it? Are you going to just receive it and install it yourself and integrate it into your, uh, your other equipment? Or are you gonna have a supply and installation type of contract where they're going to deliver a product and install it for you? So those are the, those are the, the basic differentiating factors between uh, the contracts, I would say. Right, thanks Alicia. I, I wanna to turn to Wendy, but one, one concept that's come up quite often in my practice um, is the term construction manager uh, and construction management contracts. So we've heard about EPC contracts. Uh, you know, there are a variety called EPCM contracts. Can you just explain what a construction manager does and what these specific contracts do in, in comparison to sort of the, the model that I should have laid out? Absolutely. Um, first of all, the construction manager label has kind of become a generic term to describe a situation where an owner or employer um, in the UK, as you heard, they use the term uh, employer uh, rather than owner that we traditionally uh, utilize here in the US. But um, construction management is where the owner hires an individual or firm to manage the construction of the project on the owner's behalf. Um, since the practice of construction management commenced, um, the construction manager's role has really evolved and can mean uh, different things in different contexts, depending upon the intent of the parties and, of course, the terms of the construction management agreement. Um, but the two most common types of construction managers are construction managers at risk, and I'll explain momentarily what that means. The second type is an agency construction manager, sometimes referred to as CM or construction manager as agent. Now, where the construction manager is at risk, the construction manager assumes to a greater or lesser extent some responsibility for cost, schedule, and performance of the structure or facility being built. Um, for example, the construction manager at risk may bear the risk of ensuring the completion of the project for a particular price on a defined schedule and may even act as the prime contractor for the project who is responsible for the work of the trade contractors. 
um, where the construction manager actually contracts directly with the trade contractors, its role is more akin to a traditional general contractor and the construction manager will face the liabilities uh, that are customarily imposed on a general contractor. Now, in contrast, um, CM as agent or construction manager as, agency, as, a, as agent operates as the owner's agent without assuming any liability for or offering any guarantees regarding the success of the project. Um, they even may carry a fiduciary responsibility in some, in some cases. Um, watch for that, by the way, in, in contracts. Uh, that's, a, that's a cautionary tale. Um, but an agency uh, construction manager is more akin to a traditional owner architect type relationship in that, again, the construction manager acts as the owner's agent managing the construction project in exchange for a fixed fee or a cost plus a fee. Um, you know, one of the hallmarks of CM agreements generally, construction management agreements generally, is that the construction manager gets involved early in the project, often in the development process, and may even have a role uh, to some degree in the design. Um, we call this, you know, pre-construction period pre-con, um, and, and oftentimes you'll see the construction manager enter into a separate pre-construction agreement for that purpose. And what do they do during that period? Well, they review the design that's being developed by the architect mm -hmm. for constructability issues, because who's better to, to discern potential constructability issues with a design than an actual contract or a construction manager. And so they get involved early in the design process, commenting on the design and identifying constructability issues up front so that the architect can deal with those and address them before a shovel hits the ground. Um, and, and so that there's, there's a real benefit to having them involved early in that process. And that's very different from a traditional design bid build where a contractor doesn't even touch the project until after the design is complete. Um, we won't get into the intricacies of fast track construction, which can sometimes uh, um, uh, create different issues and is, is a variation on that. Um, uh, besides, uh, during this pre-construction period, uh, construction managers will also typically have a role in estimating the budget for the project. Um, they can play a very important role in that process. Uh, oftentimes owners need help with financing, et cetera, getting the project within budget in order to meet the financing constraints of the project is extremely important. And the construction manager plays a prominent role in that process. Um, again, there are many variations on, on construction management agreements how they can, and how they can be um, structured. So it's so important to really thoroughly understand your contract, read the contract. Um, these, while there are form CM agreements, uh, certainly here in the United States, we've got the American Institute of Architects forms and the AGC consensus documents forms, both of which have very robust construction management forms and general con conditions, et cetera, um, you need to be very careful because typically those, those forms are heavily edited um, and, and to be, you know, to fit the unique needs of the project or the unique wants and, and desires of, of the owner. So it's extremely important to understand um, what your contract says so that there are no misunderstandings about the role of the construction manager. Um, Zach, you mentioned EPCM. That is a bit of a variation um, and, and, a, and a hybrid of, of the design and the construction manager fu uh, functions. Uh, I, I've seen this more internationally than I have seen it domestically here in the United States. But in an EPCM, which stands for engineering, comma, procurement and construction management. And so an EPCM consultant or contractor actually takes on the engineering function in an EPCM environment. It's, so it's a little bit more akin to an engineering services contract than it is a traditional construction contract. So the EPCM consultant or contractor takes on the engineering and design functions and then operates as a construction manager for purposes of procuring materials and equipment and 
constructing the project. They will typically be an agent for the owner um, in an EPCM agreement and will not execute trade contracts um, on their own paper. Um, they only negotiate them on the owner's behalf. I have seen hybrids of that, however, um, with, with EPCM contractors actually taking on the procurement function, for example, on a lump sum basis. So that's yet another hybrid or um, morphed variation um, on, that, on that approach. Um, but from what you can glean from what you've heard thus far, there are so many different ways to customize project delivery to suit the needs, the particular needs of a project. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. The, the one last thing I, I kind of want to cover um, on sort of project delivery methods, and, and this is I'm going to turn to Richard because when we spoke as a, as a group initially when we planned out this panel, Richard kind of raised the idea of kind of sort of non-traditional methods. And not to say there's so many varieties at this point in terms of how you structure project delivery. You know, anything is kind of technically non-traditional, but, but there are sort of some other forms that parties use to deal with um, productively that, that I think Richard uh, is well suited to kind of discuss. So Rich, I'll turn to you. What Can you talk to you a little about sort of alliancing and you know, public private partnerships, those sorts of, of models? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Zach. So I think my advice to the audience is to be aware that the global ENC industry, you know, including project delivery models and contracts is actively evolving commercially and legally to find better ways to address some of the problems when Nicholas says that, you know, a majority of large complex projects end up in some sort of failure, whether it's delay or cost overruns, I'd love to get into that separately. But uh, I'll talk about P3s and alliancing, because as we hockey met, Canadians like to say, you want to go where the puck is going. So I would pay particular attention to these. Um, with P3s, widely used everywhere by governments for all sorts of public infra asset classes, including toll roads, LRT projects, courthouses, and hospitals. P3 stands for public-private partnerships, but don't be fooled. This is not a partnership in the law school sense at all. It's primarily used for large, long-term public sector contracts where ownership often resides in the public authority. And it takes two primary forms of engaging the private sector. Uh, the private sector can design, build, and finance the construction, and then they exit or they can design, build, finance, and stick around for operating and maintenance terms, sometimes you know, as long as 30 plus years. Some people refer to them in jurisdictions as concessions or use other acronyms like build, own, transfer. Don't get hung up on the acronyms, uh, really just think about what the scope is. In any event, they're, they're, why they're important is because they're politically attractive to governments to finance infrastructure off of the government books. As they classically involve no money down during the construction phase with payment by the authority when the assets complete or even amortized over a long operating term. You know, a, a well-known US P3, I mean, I'm from Canada, but I know that the Alaskan Wave Viaduct in Seattle, the replacement project, uh, you know, was uh, is something that I think uh, most uh, American construction lawyers will know involving Tudor Perini and Dragados. Uh, and it had a, a story behind that as well, which embodies some of the principles of, of P3 that I'm mentioning. So structurally, instead of being a mere contractor, the private sector forms a special purpose vehicle uh, called Project Co, colloquially, which takes an active role, including finance, operating, and maintaining the project. And it hires the design build contractor, the operator, and deals with the debt providers, the government, the public authority. And by the way, from a practice perspective, you have so many more clients that you can act for in a P3 world because there are so many different uh, you know, parties that, that are involved beyond just a straight owner and a contractor. So I think it's great for practice development, first of all. Now, what does the contract look like? The key document is a project agreement. It's a long-term project agreement between the authority and the project code to achieve substantial performance with a long, as I mentioned, let's say 30 year tail with availability and performance payment guarantees, and then a hand back at the end, typically. Uh, under that agreement, there will be a design build agreement with the design build uh, contractor and then a separate operations agreement and then an interface between the two. Um, how are the dynamics different here, right? The risk allocation is significantly more of a download to the private sector consortium and the types of disputes to this audience in particular that can be flowing up to the authority uh, for dispute are contractually more limited with often very customized, uh, you know, bespoke uh, dispute resolution provisions. Uh, there's a corresponding concept of flowing up an equivalent project relief to flowing down relief. 
Um, another dynamic comes from the fact that there are private sector lenders who will fund construction and impose internal discipline as lenders love to do on, on the borrowers. Uh, then there's a dynamic of lifestyle costing, you know, i.e. how many times have you heard, oh, we built it this way, but now it costs, you know, way more than we thought to operate and maintain. So by putting them together in the same consortium, the contractors and the operators try to figure out how to minimize the total life cycle cost. So authorities love the fact that, you know, subgroups of the consortium are beating up on each other and all of that to, you know, provide the greatest value for money. That's all I'll say on P3s. On alliancing, alliancing tackles the uh, problem of silos as well, embodied in the traditional models. You know, you've got uh, a designer, builder, fragmented delivery, communication difficulties, adversarial, declining productivity. All these factors here, you know, we're really trying to find a better way to get people uh, to work together. And some projects, especially in the international realm, can be so risky that they can't be packaged even into, you know, P3 or, uh, you know, traditional model. Um, and so you have to think outside the box. So the oil industry uh, had innovated um, in terms of uh, inventing alliancing, essentially, this is BP in particular, uh, where you know, oil, oil rig and oil developments are notoriously difficult with conditions you can imagine. And then alliancing took hold in Australia uh, and, uh, and basically is, has been institutionalized there. And now I'm seeing it on the first project in Canada, Union Station, which is a live operating station undergoing expansion. You can't do proper diligence, environmental, geotech, you know, you've got a million adjoining landowners and uh, the authority actually tried to do a P3 and they canceled it and they turned it into an alliance. You know, what are the principles behind an alliancing project? So this will blow your mind as, as litigators. You know, good, good faith, no win-loss thinking, peer relationships with equal say, sharing and collectively managing risks and responsibilities, and no blame. I'll just stop for com comedic effect there, no blame. So the, the key elements here include a pain share, gain share, like you're all in the same canoe as we, as we Canadians like to say, a single multi-party contract, you know, no releases for, uh, sorry, or there's a release for acts and omissions uh, and reduced amounts of culpability, except in very limited circumstances, like willful breach of contract uh, or acts of insolvency, that sort of thing. But other than that, you know, you just kind of live with your group. Um, unanimous decision making, uh, payment regime where you get paid your direct costs plus a fixed or variable fee uh, for your overhead and profit, and then the pain share gain share. And then there's an overall target cost that the group is supposed to meet. So it's like a group assignment in law school or business school, right? You know, you can grumble about some of your, you know, your, your, your colleagues and who's doing more work, but ultimately, you know, the teacher just kind of gives you a group mark. And it's like a bit like that. So the work is staged with key phases, including solicitation and validation of what we're doing here with the target costs. So you kind of find out more. There's a discovery process, not in the litigation perspective, but in a front end perspective where you know more about the project and then you go from there. Um, and so, you know, that's the classical concept of alliancing. There are hybrids to that where, you know, you do agree on, on more liability subject to some caps, uh, you know, it's more indemnification, et cetera. But this is a fundamental sea change in thinking at the front end for dispute uh, practitioners. So, Zach, I will turn it back to you with that. Thanks, Richard. That, that's great. Um, it's all really, really helpful. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit, so move away from the contract and sort of the structure of these project delivery methods. And I, I want to turn to Nicholas uh, on the concept just of a contract price, lump sum, remeasurable, uh, cost plus. What are the different types of contract pricing methods that contractors can implement or owners can impose it um, on a particular project? And, and why do you use those different sorts of contract pricing methods? Yeah, okay. So um, there are obviously different ways to, to um, price a project. And, and of course, this is particularly interesting, isn't it? Because this is for the owner uh, or, or employer what, what it's all about. They want their project, but what's it going to cost? And how are they going to pay for it? Um, and and mo most projects are paid over time. So uh, you, know, you can have milestones where you achieve a certain amount of work and then a payment is made for that fixed amount of work. But it's much more common to have monthly valuations. And if you're going to do that, um, then there are a classic few ways in which you could set your, your contract up. And the lump sum you mentioned, Zach, is you know, the, classic, the classic sort of way uh, that um, you might go about procuring a project. And one that employers and, and, and actually 
we're all rather keen on if we're going to go about a project because we think we're going to pay this price, this lump sum price for this delivery of this thing. And of course, it depends on how well defined the project is because you're going to get a price from the contractor, a lump sum fixed price for that specification. Uh, and if you change your mind about it or you've missed anything, you are going to keep paying. Um, and this is where variations come along. You know, some more drawings, it's changed as a variation, you pay another price. Well, how do you work that price out? Um, and that, I suppose, brings us on to another way of looking at it. Um, remeasurement is a word that's often used, or, 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 um, um, or, or unit price, a unit price contract. And um, historically, you know, why, why would you do that? And what's it all about? And, and, and the, the history of this really is civil engineering projects, large civil engineering projects. If you're building a road or a, or a, or a railway, Anyone can, you know, if you know much about it, don't know much about it, you can, you can immediately appreciate that roads and railways are pretty flat across land that often isn't. Uh, and um, so if you're building a, um, a hundred miles of, of, of road somewhere, um, there's going to be a lot of earth or rock moving. Cut and fill is the term they use, you know, cutting into the sides of slopes, putting the, what you've cut into the, into the lower areas to, to fill the gaps. Now you're moving um, 10,000, hundreds of thousands, millions of cubic meters of soil and rock and so on sometimes. And, and this is where remeasurement comes in. In, in. A contractor could give a price for uh, excavating a cubic meter and moving a cubic meter and placing a cubic meter of different types of material. And maybe the, the, the owner's got an idea how much, it, how much quantity there will be. But, but, but rather than you, you um, having the contractor having the risk of it being 150,000 cubic meters rather than just 100,000, you'll say, well, let's let's assume it's 100,000 cubic meters. If it turns out to be more, we'll pay you the difference. If it's less, we'll only pay you for that amount. And contractors will give keener prices because they know then they can pare down the price um, because if they do less, they'll get paid less, but they'll still they'll still make a profit on each of the unit prices. And another way to think about the lump sum here is well, what's happened to that? Has that gone? Well, not really, because each unit price is still a lump sum for that little piece of work. So you do get um, um, your value for money. And often, I mean, it used to be the case really that remeasurement projects were usually better value. You, you know, the projects I worked on, usually you found that you had better rates on those and, and the jobs were um, overall more economic for the owner if they're brave enough to do it. Um, then the last category, I suppose, is cost plus or... or, or um, uh, time and time and materials, T and M, it's sometimes called, or labour and materials, or labour plant materials. You're, you're not paying for that 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 one metre cube of earth being moved, moved. Now you're paying for the cost of the person digging it, the cost of the plant, and you can see straight away there's a disconnect there potentially from a very efficient paying thirty-five dollars for to have that cube of of, of, of um, earth moved to how much by the hour for someone with a mechanical digger or maybe just with a spade? How do you control your costs with that? So why would you ever do it? Well, there is always a place for cost plus, and, and initially it was just emergency works or, or maintenance works. How else do you do that? But actually, um, you can also do this on very, very substantial projects. And, and it, it's one of the ways that the new engineering contract that's used on railway works in the UK has been um, widely used. Um, a cost plus contract with transparency as to the costs and then a target cost, which, which Richard was mentioning earlier on you know, different ways of looking at, at, at procurement, a target cost. And then if the project comes in at less, you share the, 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 the savings 60, 40 or 50, 50. If it costs more, you suffer the pain. So there's a sudden um, push there for the contractor to be very efficient, to use everything that they know about buildability in terms of how efficiently to build things um, and share and be transparent. Uh, and, and so you do actually see this approach, which seems um, furthest away from lump sum, actually perhaps being the more innovative and one of the best uh, ways actually to procure very large projects now, although it's not intuitive. You just kind of think lump sum must be the safest. But actually, it's not. Great. That's great, Nicholas. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, one thing that I think you've all alluded to a little bit, um, when you mentioned the AIA forms and the census docs, it, there, there is, you know, separate apart from sort of these, the, the structure, the sort of method of project delivery and the contract pricing, there's also this dynamic 
in the construction industry about sort of form contracts and more bespoke contracts. And so I want to talk to Richard, and Richard kind of introduced the concept a little bit. What when we refer to as sort of a form contract versus a bespoke contract, what are what are we talking about? Sort of what are the sort of more basic advantages and disadvantages of those two different approaches? Thanks, Zach. First of all, it's important to know that the standard form contracts are uh, generated by various industry associations, um, you know, generally contractor, contractors, consulting engineers, whether at a, you know, a national state uh, or international level. So they've taken upon themselves to create standard form contracts to facilitate you know, the process because you'll have owners of various levels of experience and consulting engineers and contractors with various levels of experience. And each, each of these organizations have uh, various forms of stakeholdering and committee representation and they periodically review and update the forms like the AIA does every 10 years with its last revision in 2017. Uh, and you've heard uh, consent, you know, consensus docs, new engineering contract, AIA, FIDIC. You'll be hearing about uh, FIDIC in, in more detail uh, momentarily. But you know, owners uh, will hire front-end lawyers like me to either you know, draft supplementary conditions to a standard form contract or consider uh, ditching that altogether and having a completely uh, self-generated form. Um, so the advantages of a standard form contract clearly are, you know, just like in a real estate deal, I'm sure in your own states, if you go buy a house, you know, you don't write up your own real estate agreement, you just take the agent's form, you know, put your name on it uh, and sign. So it allows players um, to have apples to apples uh, uh, contracts, especially when you procure, right, you, you'd like to have a standard form that's generally well known to the industry to have as much uh, adoption as possible. Uh, the treatment of risks and critical issues are already understood. Uh, you know, indemnities, limitation on claims, you might have case law that might have considered those forms as well, which will be pertinent to that jurisdiction. And so that is part of the common understanding. You're not changing, you know, with new words that a, a court will have to look at for the very first time. So there is a bit of comfort in terms of settlement of, of using a standard forms act. Um, now, in terms of whose form is it, you do have to peel behind the curtain a little bit because, you know, privately, some lawyers will think that certain forms may have uh, more favor, if you will, on one side or the other, um, mostly in favor of the contractor, to be honest with you. You don't really have owner organizations who get or get together and draft owner forms of documents so much. When you look at who's promulgating them, they tend to be the contractors associations, which is why it gives birth to supplementary conditions. And as Wendy mentioned, you know, extensive, sometimes the supplementary conditions will be longer than the contract itself. Uh, and so there is a balance. It depends on the market. Um, you know, and so you have to look at it with a keen eye to see whether or not the, the contract, however it's written, fits your project. Um, and there are a lot of things that are not captured in many standard forms that I've seen. Um, you know, for example, delay liquidated damages. If that is a concept, you have to typically write that in uh, and write it in in your own way. Um, performance guarantees, key personnel, uh, risk for utility relocation. If we're talking about, you know, simple, non-eventful projects, that's one thing. But the, we're talking about international projects, you know, which tend to attract more international attention, which tend to be larger in size and scale and complexity. So I would say then, you know, some of the factors in my experience where you would go beyond a standard form would be um, you want to deal with some of the dysfunctionalities in the project delivery methods that you're dealing with, tweak it, you know, adjust it so that you create those incentives, for example, like Nicholas mentioned, um, you know, with uh, sharing of pain share gain share. I've seen those embedded in otherwise standard contracts, not the NEC ones, but that uh, that don't have that mechanism, but you can create it there. Uh, and so, you know, you just go further in your project, look at the risks, um, and, and you figure out what is what is going to work because you have to procure it. You have to look a contractor or a bunch of contractors in the eye and negotiate it. I know we haven't talked about the negotiation and or the procurement process, but having a form of contract that's as workable as possible will save you lots of time in getting to yes. Uh, some owners do take a, a very aggressive stance and they see what contractors come back with and how much they can test the market. Uh, and that's just the dynamic of you know, who the owner is and, and some of the experiences that they had. But uh, really, it's a two-edged sword, as Nicholas mentioned. You know, if you try to pass on too much risk, you might end up getting prices that uh, build in that that understand that that dynamic and build in the additional potential price uh, to contractors. And we've seen contractors like Floor, SNC Lavalin, and others 
exit the fixed price market for certain uh, types of construction because they're not going to play that game. They're going to lose their shirts. They're, they've got management accountability. And when they go, you know, and we've seen, you know, like with Karelian and others, you know, high profile cases of contractor busts, bankruptcies because of these are very real risks. And so it starts with the form of contract. And, and I want to actually turn to Ayesha because this is, I mean, the form contracts in the international construction space are, are relatively common, FIDIC being really probably the dominant one, at least in my experience personally. Um, and FIDIC has all sorts of different contracts and it's a suite of, 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 of different agreements. You know, I know there's a lot to talk about there, Ayesha. Could you just kind of simply introduce what FIDIC is, you know, what the yellow book is, what the red book is? What do those contracts, those form agreements do, in, in, or at least their intent? Here we go. The tour de force of FIDIC yeah. in three <laughs> minutes or less. Uh, FIDIC, as Richard <laughs> talked about, is um, an industry organization. It is the federation of international of the International Federation of Consulting Engineers. The members of FIDIC are member associations from the various countries. So, for example, in in the in the UK, it's Institute of um, Consulting Consultants I, I, ICE. In the US, it's um, the American ACEC, and in Sweden, it is the Owner Architects Association. So the, the, that's that's who FIDIC is. What what that does is the traditional role of the the in consulting engineer and the architect was the procurement advisory, trusted advisor to the owners. So FIDIC publishes their own contracts. They're not negotiated with anybody else. FIDIC decides and publishes these contracts through their contracts committee. So they're seen to be, or put out to be, fair and balanced risk allocation. So we, all, we, we, we start from that very point of risk allocation. And they're, may, they're, they're produced for international projects or for use on international projects. And the first FIDIC contract was produced in 1957 uh, after the rebuilding uh, post-World War II. And it was for a FIDIC red book for design bid build. So the traditional construction only contract. And it allocated uh, the risk of construction, unforeseen site conditions. It taught, I was interesting to hear Richard about delay damages. It, it, it took all those general risks and it's developed into two parts. The general conditions, which allocates the general risks that are experienced on a contract of, a na of, of that similar type. And those are the general conditions and it has um, conditions for particular application which are written for that particular jurisdiction or the technical contours of the project. Fast forward as different types of project delivery methods came into being and um, FIDIC used to develop contracts for construction only of civil works, which is the red book. The yellow book was for plant. And then they published their first design build contract in 1995. Today, when we're talking about red, yellow, and silver, the differentiation between those books is a project delivery method. So the red book, regardless of the type of project, is the traditional project delivery method, and it's for construction only. So the design is expected to be completed and you tender on a completed design for construction only. The yellow book is design build. So you're tendering on a conceptual design for the completion of the, de the, the detailed design and the execution of the construction under the yellow book. What differentiates the yellow book from the silver book, they're both design build, but in the silver book, you're transferring more risk to the contractor. It's an EPC turnkey type of solution where uh, generally used for um, private finance, where you want, you don't have so much appetite for construction risk, but you're willing to pay a premium for transferring risks like unforeseen site conditions 
but in the foreword to the silver book, Fittick definitely uh, um, recommends those the silver book to not be used for underground types of projects. Now, Fittick has added to that rainbow suite the Emerald Book for un for underground uh, works in 2019, the Gold Book for design, build, operate, which could be used on the PPP, the uh, a dredging type of contract. So, and they also have um, a consultant agreement, which is the Fittick White Book. So, between the owner and the architect, or the employer and the consulting engineer. So that's. Tour de force of Fiddick. If I've missed anything, I apologize. But that's the three minutes of Fiddick for today. No, th thank you, Aisha. And, and you know, I, I I had some other questions for Wendy and Nicholas, and, and I apologize to both of you because I, I want to keep moving into sort of dispute resolution. But I guess I, I will just throw this out there for both of you, uh, just very briefly. Uh, you know, in the U.S., Wendy, I, I see the AIA come up sometimes. I, I mostly see bespoke agreements, and, and I know in the U.K., Nicholas, there are a wide variety of form contracts. I don't know, in, in either of your experiences, do you tend to see you know, US and UK practice differ that much in terms of how often you see form agreements versus bespoke agreements? Or is, do you tend to see more form and less bespoke or vice versa? Or does it really not, doesn't really matter? It really depends on the project. Mm -hmm. um, large infrastructure projects, um, uh, power projects, et cetera, they're customized. Um, you know, they, they hire a law firm, they spend a lot of money uh, on that law firm uh, customizing a form that's unique to that project. Um, contrast that, however, with some, you know, traditional vertical construction, uh, high rises, condos, um, commercial uh, uh, projects, uh, you see more AIA. Um, and I think that's just because it's easier and less expensive than going out and hiring a law firm to draft a customized contract. Um, so it's really a function of that. Um, you know, here in the United States, we don't see fitted contracts hardly ever. Um, and that's largely, I think, because of the terminology and the fact that AIA has such a lock on, on the industry still, um, uh, because they're very similar in many respects other than the terminology, which will you know, give you a headache trying to uh, cross-reference. But um, um, when I've seen, I have seen a couple of contractors try to use FIDIC forms in the United States and, and it didn't work out well, mainly because the, most of the project participants were unfamiliar with them. And so that, that caused problems due to the unfamiliarity. Whereas AIA, as, as someone mentioned earlier, people are very accustomed to seeing. Uh, courts have, have considered them. There's lots of precedent um, on how they're interpreted. So it's just easier. Um, but again, it all depends on the type of project and, and the, the needs of that, of that project. What do you think, Nicholas? Do you, do you tend to see more form agreements or and or bespoke agreements, or is it is it really the dynamic that Wendy? I agree about? completely with Wendy. That that's exactly what happens in in the UK. So I, I think there's not a great deal of difference between the UK and the US approach. When I get together with with uh, lawyers and engineers from both jurisdictions, there's lots of terminological differences, which makes me makes me we think it's different. Actually, is a a culture and a history of building and, and a legal system that's so similar. Um, and, um, you know, she mentions vertical building versus horizontal in exactly the way that we look at it and its approach is, is, is the same. I think one, one reflection is um, that um, uh, when you see these EPC contracts, the very substantial detailed contracts, often there's a lot of FIDIC in them. Um, or, or another standard form, but usually FIDIC actually. Um, and that's because an owner's taken the contract, used it, learned their, from their experiences, and then started to amend it. And then one day thought, well, I've got a 65 page contract and 35 pages of amendments. I might as well consolidate it before you know it's become a bespoke 200 page super duper contract. But the history of the wording and the terminology is in there. And you, know, you find these stock sentences and you can pick out an old English case from the railways of 100 years ago on it. And there it is on all these contracts around the world uh, with the same wording, a practical completion, substantial completion, all this sort of stuff. Um, and the other thing I think is that, you know, a lot of the standard forms started out as learned professionals, whether they were lawyers, usually not, they're usually engineers, that got together to draft a standard form to make their life easier. 
you know, that we need something on the next project rather than spending forever drafting something. And and that changed a while ago. So JCT produces um, the the vertical stuff in the UK, and the horizontal stuff was the Institution of Civil Engineers that became sort of NEC really. Um, but you went from uh, people doing it in their spare time, as it were, in committees for drafting, so that you had a contract. So suddenly it became a business. And that's why I think there is a mushrooming of standard forms, one for lump sum, one for enrichment, one for private clients, one for this, one for that. There's products there now for everything, which is why you have so many. And, you know, I think we're seeing that more and more the world over. And um, in one respect, it's helpful to the, the pumpers because they can find the right thing. From the other perspective, it's very easy for the uninitiated to pick up the wrong thing or a lot of construction professionals take the last standard form they use onto the next job and the next job. You suddenly find you've got a baby contract being used on a 20 million pound project where it's actually only supposed to be used something up to a million. Um, and um, th there's a big disconnect really, I suppose, in, in, that, in that respect. But there's a, there's a wealth of standard forms out there. We're gonna see more. There's a, an electronic playbook now in England that, that the government supports. So you, you pick and mix electronically. Um, uh, and we're going to see more of that, that sort of stuff, I think, coming along. So it's going to be fun for the next few years. That's great. I mean, I, I appreciate that. Because one of the, the, the big reasons I picked all the panelists or, or found all of you is you all have very different experiences. And so that, that I found that very interesting, Nicholas. And I had a whole sort of, we were planning to talk a little bit about dispute resolution. I think we're running over. Um, you know, I, I think the only thing I will say is obviously this, I would be kind of remiss not to mention international arbitration in light of this is being sponsored by the ICDRY and I, and that this is really directed sort of arbitration practitioners, but obviously sort of international arbitration tends to be the sort of dominant dispute resolution model. Um, I, I guess I'll leave it to Aisha to give maybe the last word, just in terms of you know, dispute resolution causes and dispute resolution methods. You know, what are you seeing out there, um, you know, whether it be dispute boards or mediation or any other sort of uh, dispute resolution models? What, what are you seeing to be the most common, the most effective in your experience? Well, I, I mean, I, I think simply stated, I, I think because of the risks and because that risks happen in construction, there is always an escalated type of clause in most standard contracts. You will see some, I mean, the mediation is very popular in the US. Uh, dispute review boards are also popular. I mean, we, we can look at the big dig in Boston and look at the plethora of possibilities. But um, in, in, when you're working with international, you, you see more of a decision-making body, like a, dis, a dispute adjudication board, or the engineer um, carries the old architect's role in AIA of being the resolver of disputes between the, construct between the contractor and the employer. Uh, dispute boards, dispute both review, di where they give, make a recommendation or dispute adjudication boards where they make um, a decision on behalf of the parties, a contractually binding decision are very popular. They are one of the steps, um, one of the significant steps in FIDIX uh, suite, red, yellow, and silver. And, but there's two types of dispute boards. You can have an ad hoc dispute board or a standing dispute board. And the difference is a standing dispute board is constituted at the beginning of the project. And the, the, what you see in the industry now is you're tending towards dispute avoidance where you have a standing dispute board, um, not just adjudicating disputes, but assisting the parties to raise issues early and turn their heads uh, to addressing and maybe resolving an, uh, the issue at hand. Maybe it's a, a contractual provision, an interpretation of a particular provision in the contract as to avoid the escalation of disputes. And that I see as a trend internationally uh, for cost effectiveness and also um, if we look to the World Bank standard bidding documents, in their high risk projects, they are now uh, mandating the use 
of standing dispute boards and not allowing um, the, uh, the commencement of works prior to the kickoff meeting, which requires the dispute board to be in attendance. So, so you'll see a lot more of dispute boards um, on international funded projects by multilateral development banks. So escalated clauses, dispute boards, mediation. Right. Um, um, so I, I, I've kind of promised to keep this to an hour. I recognize you, know, you, yeah. you go over an hour and it basically infringes on everyone else's time during the day. So <laughs> uh, I, uh, I think I'm going to, to stop here. Um, I did just, I think there's one question, Aisha, maybe you could respond to it. Um, that Sean Dooley raised just. Uh, you, you have to have a license from FIDIC to use the book on a product. I mean, this is, I'm, get, I'm giving the, you can buy a book, but what FIDIC uh, says, you have to have a license for using um, the book. There is a further license if you want to change um, the general conditions inside the general conditions themselves and have, uh, or you need to produce a particular, a particular condition. So two types of licenses. One is just the standard um, purchase of a yellow book. And then you produce particular conditions separately for the customization of the general conditions. There's a different type of license that's negotiated separately with FIDIC that you, can, that you will have access to the general conditions and essentially creating your own uh, bespoke contract instead of having a set of general conditions and a set of particular conditions. So license is required. Great, thanks Ayesha. So uh, before I go, I just wanted to uh, give a shout out to the ABA Forum on Construction Law, uh, the Society of Construction Law North America and, and Y Construction for helping us uh, sponsor this event. Um, I, you know, I thank everyone who attended. Uh, Lewis, I don't know if you have anything further to add. Bill, I just wanted to let everybody know, by the way, that we have a very interesting app called clausebuilder.org. It's an actual interactive app where you go through and it asks you questions regarding the development of your arbitration agreement. And as you go through it and you respond to the questions at the end, you can actually print out the clause that you've designed. It also provides you with an excellent overview of issues to consider when you're drafting your international arbitration agreement. So that's it, but I did want to really thank all of you for the wonderful job you did today. A big round of applause for our panel. And uh, thank you very much. We didn't get to all of your questions. We got to some, but as I said, the program will be posted and stay tuned for the next three parts of this International Construction Arbitration Series information available on the YNI site. Good day, everyone, and thank you. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.